Uh, I think you can hear me. Janet, can you hear me? Yeah, oh yeah. A lot of people, <coughs> unchurched atheists, say, how can you believe in something that says the world started in 43 BC, 4300 BC? And the world really started 13.8 billion years ago. But what they don't realize is the Bible is not a history of the world. It's a history of the Jewish faith, Jewish people. And that's where a lot of people get it wrong. Now, I found this when I was writing my book. I found this. And I absolutely think it's fascinating. And basically what it does, it compares what I call secular history with biblical history. Secular history being the one that historians write that are not connected with the Bible or the religion. And what this says is Adam and Eve started 43, I think it's about 4300 BC. And then you have uh, uh, Abram and Noah is here, and the floods are in this area here. And then you come down to uh, where Noah's, Noah's sons, Shem, uh, Ham and Japheth are sent out after the flood to repopulate the world. Now, in secular history, there's, there is evidence of a great flood in, in that region of the world uh, around 10,000 BC. And they say the waters rose 300 feet, and this was as the glacier was melting. And that's where then Shem goes out, and we'll talk about this, to settle certain parts of the world. Um, Ham, I think, did Egypt. Shapeth did, like the Asia, and, and Shem did Western civilization. So that's where we start. Now, 4300 BC is kind of midway between the agrarian, what's called the agrarian area. Remember I said my, my book is divided into four sections. It's divided into the hunter-gatherer era, which kind of comes like from 300,000 years ago in to about 10,000 years ago. So that's when man first spoke when man first wrote goes from like 10,000 or yeah 10,000 BC to the reformation that's when man first printed and then the current era we're living in which starts around like 1970 according to historians and that's the digital age so what we're talking about right now is we're going from the from the uh, hunter-gatherings era to the agrarian area, as they call it. So, let us start. Now, last week, I, I taught, I, I'm going to just quickly review what I wrote about last week, or talked about last week, was this, when man first wrote, I got into that last week. Before that, we covered Two lessons before we covered the, the uh, when man first spoke. And I came up with a, a problem that I struggled with for a long time. And that was, how in the world could man have lived 900, 800 years? Just didn't make sense. And then I discovered something. Emmanuel Villacasi in this book here, and I kind of came across these right about the time I retired. 
Worlds in Collision. And this, I think, is a possible explanation to why secular history and biblical history don't match. Emanuel Vilikoski in his book, Worlds in Collision, postulated that around the 15th century BC, the planet Venus was ejected from Jupiter as a comet or a comet-like object that passed very near Earth a number of times. So you have the sun and you have the planets in a circular orbit and here comes this Venus in an elliptical orbit around the sun. So it's, I don't know, he doesn't say how frequently it visited, but that's his theory. Now, then the comet was captured by the solar system as a, as a planet. It was known as the day the sun stood still, implying that the days got longer. When the comet was captured by the solar system, it would or could change the Earth's distance from the sun, the length of rotation around the sun, the rotation of the Earth about its axis, and its precession, which is the axis wobble. The, the axis of the Earth actually wobbles about one revolution in like 20,000 years, so it doesn't wobble very much. The comet was captured by the solar system. It was known as the day the sun stood still, implying a longer day. When the comet was captured by the solar system, it would change uh, all the, that it could change the length of the daylight, the day, so the week, months, or the year, reason, the seasons of the year, like when and how. So basically, what, what it's suggesting is there are more years of the Noah family in our years. So there might have, so the years might have occurred much faster. And that's when they counted those, that's how they got the 900, when it should be, if it's compared to ours, it would be a lot less time. In these books, and there's three more that he wrote, uh, he talks about the chaos and the catastrophes that were occurring during this period of time. And I can imagine when the comet came very close to Earth. Uh, I remember my, my mother talked about a comet that around 1918 uh, was very prevalent in the skies. and. Uh, how much they feared this because they thought the comet was going to probably or could hit the Earth. But in the case of the comet we're talking about here, it did come very close. And that's how he, point, he talks the parting of the Red Sea in the Bible. When a comet would come that close to Earth, it would put a tremendous gravitational pull then could separate the water. And then that would allow the Jewish people to go through. Oh, before that, the chaos and the catastrophe gave them the opportunity to escape because, you know, they, they just couldn't, the, the army was in disarray and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that would allow the Jewish people to, to leave Egypt and be on their way. The parting of the Red Sea allowed them to get through the comet passed as, the, as uh, the, the Egyptians were trying to come after him and drown the army. So that's the drowning of Ramsey II in the army. And even the man in the wilderness, they talk about how it could have been created because the gases in the Venus and the gases on Earth were different. And as it, as it passed through, it created this kind of like a... a, a I guess the best thing to describe it would be a, a kind of a, a web of food that came down on Earth that they could eat and survive and because they probably weren't able to raise crops and all that kind of stuff. And then he also talks about 
how the plagues could have resulted from the disarray and people were probably not sanitary and all that kind of stuff. So that's the explanation of the Lukowski. Now, in these other book, Ages and Chaos, People of the Sea, Ramses two and three times, he talks about the reconstruction of ancient history. So as, as these events were occurring, he compared what he thought when the comet was here would have caused. And what it did was it, it corrected a lot of dates that things happened in, in, a, in as we know it today, written by the secular historians compared to what's in the Bible. And then he has a fourth book, Oedipus and Akhenaten, which is kind of myth and history. Now, this theory that he put forward caused a lot of controversy in the scientific community in the 1970s. And uh, the book has been heavily criticized as a work of what uh, they call pseudoscience, a system of theories, assumptions, and methods erroneously regarded as scientific. And that was put forth by Carl Sagan, who Carl Sagan was at Cornell University and was considered one of the big scientists of astro astronomy in, in, in the, his era. But others have said Vilikoski did not get a fair hearing from the scientific community. Also, some recent evidence from the space is that may support this theory, theory of Vilikoski's. Now, the historians, which Vilikoski was part of, it, Egyptian historians, they, they were very complimentary of the books and claimed that they, it, it, it settled a lot of dates and corrected a lot of dates that secular history hadn't gotten right. So uh, you have the scientific community that says, oh, that can't happen. That's not the way the, the world works. It's, it's too orderly and all that, and uh, implying that any other planet in the war, in the, going around a star or the sun would be doing it in the same way that uh, it happened here on Earth, on Earth and elsewhere. Now, our scientific community is seeking exoplanets to find out if we are alone. And this is actually work sponsored by the government that are looking for uh, other planetary systems like ours, uh, finding stars that have planets like us that would allow them to, to uh, uh, compare how we are with the rest of the world, suggesting that when they find these other planets going around the sun, they'll be very much like ours. And one, I guess they're trying to figure out if flying saucers really can come from some place. An exoplanet is a planet beyond our solar system. In this article in a, in a uh, National Geographic in 2009, and I quote from this article, we believe that billions of such planets must exist. Billions, they're talking billions of planets like ours, planetary system. It's, I just can't comprehend this thing they talk about. And that they hold the promise of expanding not only the scope of human knowledge, but also the richness of the human imagination. To date, there are like, to date, which was 2009, they had found 370 exoplanets, suns that had planets like ours going around them. A lot of the stars don't have that, a lot of the suns don't have that. Now, as of 2020, they have found more than 4,000 exoplanets. And you know, the launching of these, uh, kind of recently they're launching a telescope. That's what they're looking for. They're sending these things out looking for these planets, planets elsewhere. 
Um, but the world continuing, the world's orbiting stars other than the sun, many are so strange as to confirm the biologist J.P.S. Haldine's famous remark that the universe is not only queer than, than we suppose, it, but queer than we can, um, can suppose or can imagine. Uh, and in one of these uh, planetary systems, they found uh, uh, a hot Saturn 260 light years from Earth whirling around a planet so rapidly that a year there lasts less than three days. So that's kind of what happened in the time we were talking about here. The days were much shorter. The years came much faster. So that satisfied me to say that maybe, maybe there's somebody out there that's watching over us. So the bottom line, I said, so it is possible in Noah's day to have had more years in what we know of as our year today. So, so any comments, questions? Make sense? Yeah. It does to me. Uh, so now we get back to the Bible and uh, the covenants that uh, were made, and we'll cover this, and then uh, I think we'll probably stop for today. Uh, we must also remember that the Bible was not written as a historical text, but was written to define our relationship to our God, and now to bring about our salvation and deliverance from the demonic forces of sin. The Bible established the basis of our relationship to God as a series of covenants, which we in the modern world would call a contract or a treaty, a will or a marriage license. God's first covenant with humankind, Genesis 9, is with Noah and his sons Shem, Hem, and Japheth after the flood in which he resents and renews the blessings of his creation reconfirms his confidence in humanity. This provides for the self-control of, of human evil and violence. Shem, Hem, and, and Japheth, and that's why I was sitting earlier. Shem's line is Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Joseph, Moses, Saul, David, Solomon, Christ. Hem kind of open up Egypt. And Japheth is Greece, Rome, Persia, Indo-Germanic tribes, Japan, and China. So uh, Shem kind of went the way Western civilization evolved. Hem kind of watched over Egypt and launched it, and Japheth kind of launched Asia and that part from Greece to Asia. So. We say Greece played an important part in our history. So Greece influenced our history, but Greece also influenced Asia's history. Now, I call it the birth of farming. Because of the floods, hunting by the men and gathering by the women, could no longer provide an adequate food supply. But the ingenuity of womankind, they were the first inventors, uh, and they developed the know-how for planting seeds to supplement the foraged food supply. So the women are really the ones that launched the, the uh, uh, world we're living in. And over the centuries of nurturing in today's world, we call this selective breeding. Change the grain structures that God gave us that could be reseeded by natural, nature's blowing winds to a more heavily structured than was more wholesome yet easily harvested. So what they did was 
back in, you know, 40, oh no, about 28, 2800 BC, they started selective breeding of food stock. Now, by tending the crops, though, requires a sedimentary lifestyle. Before that, hunter-gatherers, if they, if they got short of food, they just move on. And that's how the world became populated. You know, they just kept moving on. That's how I talked about Noble's Pond. That's about 10,000 years ago. That's how people came from Africa all the way through, probably in their case, through Asia, across the Pacific, and, or down through Alaska into America. So, by tending crops requires a sedimentary lifestyle. So, a place to work and play in one place, hopefully in peace, to labor, care, and develop the know-how to cultivate their food rather than gathering it in the wind. The men were the former hunters, developed the know-how to build farm villages with grass huts that with time became more substantial mud brick structures. So the men kind of focused on, on animals, domesticating animals and building buildings, and the women focused on raising food uh, by f sort of farming. It became clear fairly early in the involvement and development of the agrarian area in Egypt and Mesopotamia, that control of the water supply to irrigate the crops in the dry climate of Mesopotamia, known today as the Middle East and Egypt, was strategically important and a priority for survival. Now, domesticating animals, as it turned out, using irrigation, know-how farms became very productive and produced more goods than individual farmers could consume. The men again selected breeding, domesticated sheep, cows, and goats, and changed their hairy coats of sheep to wool so they could be sheared to make clothing. So think about it. I mean, the selective breeding that we think is kind of unique to our times. They were doing that back at the beginning of time. Goats and cows could be milked for food. Oxen provided energy for plowing. And by 6000 BC, cattle and pigs were added to the herd. And by 7500 BC, farming became the main source of food supply. So now we're not needing to be hunter-gathering anymore. In Europe, which is the land I settled in, are from, in Europe agriculture began about 7,000 BC. And remember I had said, you know, I traced my genetics through the National Geographic gene study. They say I'm part of the out of Africa group that went up in the Middle East and then came over into uh, uh, Germany in that direction, Donna's genetic showed that she went directly from, from Africa up into Spain and then into Germany. So she took a different route, or her family took a different route than I did. So in Europe, unlike the drier climates of Egypt and Mesopotamia, and, and in there because of the drier climates, they had to invent irrigation. Um, but thick, dense hardwood forests covered the landscape following the melting of the glacier, and the know-how didn't exist then to clear the forest. So agriculture had to wait until nature cleared the land. This came with the creation of the Baltic Sea and the melting of the glacier. The shoreline of the Baltic Sea provided rich, fertile soil for farming without the need for irrigation. As population density increased, European headed south to the Danube River Valley, the land where the Leibensburgers clan lived today. So where my ancestors that came over here in 1732 came from southwestern Germany. 
at the end of their journey, they became shepherds. And so they were shepherds in southwestern Germany, the area of which today is called Das Holdenlanger land in southwestern Germany. To clear the land, they slashed and burned the dense forests, stripped the bark around the circumference of trees, which killed the trees and burned the dead trees. They lived in long houses, which were like 40 to 80 feet long with their animals, which in winter would keep them warm. And, and this was an early German custom. So the New World farmers became so successful that a small portion of the population became available to do other things. Farming in ancient times required approximately 90% of the population compared to today, where agriculture in the U.S. is 0.6% of our gross domestic product. I remember my grandfather, who lived with us as I was growing up, he was a farmer. And he, I can remember often, and he, he, uh, he, I, he was in his 80s when I was growing up. And uh, he would, he mowed the grass, he tended all of the outside of our house, and he had about, he had a, a, a lot, a plot of land, about almost like two acres. And then behind our house were gardens, and he would raise all kinds of food which in the summertime he and my mother would can. And, and anyway, he used to walk the fields because he liked to look at what the farmers were doing. And he started to see all these factories taking over the land. So I can remember the conversation at our dinner table. I don't know how you're gonna feed yourself when you grow up. I mean, they're farm, they won't be able to farm anymore because there'll be all these factories in the way. So he was, he was very concerned whether I would survive or not. Now the excess labor became artisans, craftsmen, priests, charmen in hunter-gathered days, kings, chief in hunter-gathering days, queens that, uh, with their attendants, and paid soldiers focused full-time on serving, creating, making, and trading things among themselves. The artisans, craftsmen, priests, kings, and queens congregated in what initially was were uh, villages that grew into cities and the farmers lived in the surrounding countryside that grew into states. So I think we're going to stop there and uh, continue uh, in developing the, the farmlands and developing factories and our day and so forth. Any discussion, any points you want to talk about? I'm just amazed at the amount of research you've put yourself through and how you're able to bring it together. I've been working on it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I said worlds in collision. I, when I retired, I actually, I actually came across those books in the 1970s, right when, he, when they were first coming out. And uh, I have a, a bunch of stuff at home from Carl Sagan writing, criticizing him. And as I put this together, I don't have time to read the books, and I should read them again because they were quite interesting. But after I write the book, I'll go back and rewrite, read those because I really think, I really think he has it right. I really think, uh, uh, the Bible, the timeline in the Bible, which a lot of people say is not right because God created the world 13.8 billion years ago, not 43 BC, when in fact he's, he's telling us what he created. That you, this, he created one God because before that, everybody, everybody was following multi, you know, polytheists. There were, you know, Greece had hundreds of gods. So, it's, uh, like I said, it's an interesting world we live in, so. Hey, Bob, you had mentioned the telescope. Yeah. You were talking about the telescope that's going to be launched. I believe it's the 
James Webb telescope that's going to be launched in December. Yeah. And that telescope is going to be so powerful that they're going to be able to see to the, they, they say, beyond the curtain of the beginning of the universe, oh. which is fascinating. I, I can't wait until they you know, tell us what they see. <laughs> you know, and I'll get into this, but the, the expanding universe, remember, God created something from nothing. He created time, he created, and you know, the part I'm writing right now, the, they call them the, the uh, church fathers from uh, like Augustine up through uh, uh, the Renaissance. They had people in there and they, they were trying to prove, have a proof of existence. And one of them I just discovered, you know, I told you last week that, that my, my Damascus Road experience that I had was um, when I went to college and came home the first Thanksgiving and started to talk a little bit about what I was learning in Lehigh. And my father uh, didn't think it was right, so he straightened me out and said, I'm not sending you to that school to learn that stuff, you know. But anyway, um, then when I got into thermodynamics, first law of thermodynamics says you can't create something from nothing. And I said, well, how were we created? Maybe there is a God. So I, uh, I started from that place. And, and then, of course, uh, when you marry a minister's, Lutheran minister's daughter, you're, you go the rest of the way, so. So, um, it, uh, it I, I find it very fascinating, so. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you, so. Next week we'll get back into Talking about uh, you know what's what's coming now will be the development of the Middle East. So that's that's the other thing I'll give you give you a heads up. Uh, you know the out of Africa theory for the that is what we're living in. Uh, you. You create the Middle East, and then you have Greece uh, take over, and you have Confucius who, Greece, the philosophers of Greece were this kind of the secular historians trying to figure out where we came from. They went through, from the Middle East into Greece, into Italy, into Europe, into the United States. In, in, uh, the case of Asia, the, the uh, uh, Confucius is the one that was the philosopher that set up the, the religions that ultimately caused the religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, to evolve in, in the Western, um, or in the Eastern world. And anyway, the thing that Christianity did in coming of Christ you know, the philosophies that were developed, except like Plato was, in, you know, I'm talking Greece now, Plato was more helping defend the, the Christian, Christianity, and of course, probably helped develop it. But Confucius, in the case of the, of the Eastern civilizations, the, if you look at Hinduism and Buddhism, it's a focus on, on, your, on, on yourself. And what Christianity did was say, you know, you gotta give, share, love, and care. And so Christianity developed into a religion that not only, you know, you can't live by bread alone, focused on caring for others. And that never happened in Eastern civilization with Buddhism. 
you know, Buddhism, you have uh, the, the uh, different caste systems, and you know, they preach if you live a good life, you maybe get into a higher caste the next time you come around. And Buddhism is more focused on Zen and, and focusing on improving yourself. And that's why when we're not bringing the worlds together, we, we come up in a different way. And that's, I think, why we have the conflict between you know, the Western civilization and China and people like that. So anyway, that's yet to come. So, okay. Thank you.